Right. All right, looks like we're back. <clears throat> so uh, I distributed out a, uh, a new tutorial, uh, print out optimal lunar flyby using multiple shooting. Um, so let me just introduce this by saying that uh, this is going to be by far the most advanced tutorial that we're doing. And uh, it's advanced in a couple ways. So one, we're using optimization, which we haven't before. We've just been doing targeting for the rest or earlier today. So we're using optimization. Um, we're using a method called multiple shooting, which I'll explain in a minute. That's uh, just takes more uh, algorithmic smarts to hook together, and I'll, you'll sort of see how that um, comes to play. Um, thirdly, we'll be using the script interface instead of the GUI. So we won't be pointing and clicking anywhere. We're going to be looking at a pre-written script and sort of going through it, explaining, drawing diagrams of how it works. And then we'll make a few key uh, changes, watch the results, uh, et cetera. Um, this is, the other scripts are potentially something you could write up in a day if you had a problem. This is something uh, where, um, you know, it's something you would spend weeks and months creating. Uh, but it, it sort of illustrates how you can use GMAT for a more advanced problem. So unfortunately for the, um, the web conferencing folks, the version that, of GMAT that we're, we were putting out there for you guys does not have the optimization plugin that uh, is used for this uh, tutorial. So the best thing I can say right now is that um, if you're interested in technique or how it could be used, go ahead and listen in. Uh, not a lot of it is going to be uh, running GMAT. Instead, we're going to be describing the, the algorithm and going through the general technique. Um, and then at the end, we'll run it. And uh, when I say that the plugin is, is internal only, we're using a plugin called uh, an algorithm called VF13AD optimizer, uh, which is free code. It's a Fortran optimizer. It's, it's released by um, University in Great Britain. I'm not sure what the name is. It's, it's, if you Google Harwell subroutine library, HSL, VF13, everything will come up. You can actually download the code for free. You just have to sign an agreement. And then if you wanted to, you could compile the plugin with that bit of code you downloaded, and you would have what we created. We're just not allowed to give it out beyond ourselves. Um, so that's that. So I'll begin by just talking about the uh, sort of theory of what we're doing. Um, and folks on the phone, you can uh, you can open up the user guide here and go to uh, page 116 of the PDF. Page 116 is the beginning of this tutorial. It says it'll take 90 minutes. I think it'll go till about 4:15, and then we'll wrap up. Um, and you know it explains everything we're we're about to do, so you can follow along in that way. So let's start with some uh, explanation. So we didn't we we made the tutorial generic, so it's applied to a generic mission, uh, explaining a, a generic um, you know trajectory, but it's really based on this. Uh, trajectory called TESS. So TESS is the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. It's in development right now. Um, half my time is spent working on it. And I've, um, I didn't develop this script, but I work a lot at, on improving it and, and expanding it and uh, stuff for that mission. So TESS is a follow-on to the Kepler mission. Uh, Kepler was the first spacecraft to uh, 
discover the existence of exoplanets. Um, it's sort of at end of life right now. Um, but its mission was, was very um, specific. It was sent to uh, perform a statistical determination of how likely it is that an exoplanet would exist around a certain star. So it was not doing a survey of all available space. It was looking at a few representative stars and trying to answer this very statistical question of, you know, how many stars we're looking at, how many exoplanets can we find, what's the likelihood that any given star will have any given planet around it. So TESS is different. Um, TESS is doing a survey, so it's parked in a, in a highly eccentric Earth orbit in a quiet environment, and it's performing sort of a, a survey of the entire visible sky. Uh, sort of it stares, and then it clicks over, and it stares, and it clicks over, and it stares, and it performs a survey. And it's specifically looking to find all uh, exoplanets that it can see that are within the habitable zone of their planet. So it's specifically looking for Earth-like planets, uh, Earth-like being they exist in that habitable zone, they're about the right size. Um, the stars it's looking for are smaller than Earth's sun, so it's not going to be exactly like Earth, but analogous to Earth. And the way it does that is um, the way it does that is if here's the star, you have the planet sort of going around the star, and what you'll see is you have this uh, you'll have this brightness, star brightness going along here. And then when the planet comes into view, the brightness, or when the planet goes in front of the star, the brightness will drop. And then when it exits its transit, the brightness will go up. And it'll continue on like that. So TESS is actually looking for a, uh, it's just a set of cameras. It's specifically looking at stars, and it's looking for this sort of stair-step signature. Um, in the stars in its field of view. And then it can take, you know, the light um, that it captures during this period, it can look at uh, spectral signatures and figure out what the likely um, atmosphere of that planet is, what it's made of. And it can send uh, the properties of that to JWST for uh, higher powered analysis. So part of the mission is when it finds uh, a set of good candidates, it'll send that over to JWST. JWST will take a closer look and we'll get better science um, that way. So we're interested in TESS because here because it has a very interesting orbit. Um, so it's two to one lunar, lunar resonant. What that means is uh, it is an Earth orbiting spacecraft that has half the period of the moon. So it goes around twice every time the moon goes around once. Um, uh, Earth-centered. So why are we doing that? Well, it's highly stable. So anytime you have a resonant orbit, whether it's 2 to 1 or 3 to 1 or 4 to 1, um, it's always some ratio of the period of the, uh, of the other body that you're resonant with. So uh, we're 2 to 1, so we're half period half that of the moon. Uh, and the benefit of this is that it's extremely stable no station keeping necessary for the entire life of the mission. The life is uh, two year, two year plus two year, so it's a two year nominal plus two year extended mission. And so over that two years, or over that possible four year period, no propellant is expended in any way after it arrives on orbit. So that's the benefit of that. And actually, um, we have simulations that go out for 100 years, and we're, we're pretty much stable after 100 years. So it's a very, very interesting environment. And uh, it's far from Earth. So what we do is uh, we, uh, I'll zoom in over here. We started here near Earth. This picture is, uh, is more centered on Earth than, than it should be. But we start down here, and we go way out and come back and way out. So we have close periods where we can downlink all this good science data. We have far periods where it spends, you know, 90% of its time way away from Earth with no uh, radiation or, or light scattering or anything 
uh, associated with with the Earth. So it's sort of best of both worlds um, sort of orbit. So how is this orbit designed? Um, well, we start in LEO. Let me get a better picture here. All right. So we start in LEO, uh, low Earth orbit. That's this green trajectory. We start here at a perigee of like 200, 300 kilometers, typical low Earth orbit, uh, low Earth parking orbit. We use a lunar swing by to change the inclination. So our final mission orbit, this orange, um, is inclined uh, 10 degrees to the equator in this scenario. So if we're launching from Kennedy, 28 and a half, we need to get down to 10. We could burn a lot of fuel to do that. Or we could uh, use a, a lunar swing by to change that eccentricity and kick our perigee and apogee way out to what we need. So that's what we do, uh, swing by. And then uh, we do a perigee burn to create the right size mission orbit to get our resonant condition. Okay, so I have this picture here. So here's TOI. We're calling that transfer orbit insertion. That's basically the launch vehicle. It puts us right here. We go out on this uh, transfer orbit to our swing by, flyby. Uh, that's the moon. We perform a flyby and we go out into this nice big transfer orbit out past the moon's uh, orbit radius. And then we come in here to perigee. Uh, we design this so that we get a perigee that matches our mission specs. We perform a mission orbit insertion. And now we're into our mission orbit with a nice uh, resonant condition. Perigee and apogee uh, meet our mission requirements. And we basically just, uh, in the actual mission, we'll have like a little correction just past here to make sure we're on the right track. Um, but after that, we're done. We just sit in that resonant orbit for two or four years and sit there and observe, downlink data, observe and we're good. So how do we design such a thing? Well, our naive approach would be if you just sat down and said, all right, I want to get in this orbit. How do I do it? You would probably start at some orbit that you think is reasonable. You put yourself at 28 and a half degrees inclination at 200 kilometers perigee, circular orbit, and you guess at a, at a transfer orbit injection maneuver. So you say, I think maybe two kilometers a second, something like that, would put me out to the moon. And you would propagate forward uh, past this flyby. And you would go out. You'd tweak things so that you ended up at the right uh, perigee. And then you'd guess at a, a MOI burn um, that would put you in this orbit. So you do the whole thing forward. You have a couple very commands in there, maybe some optimization. And, uh, and you try to match these conditions. Um, Turns out that's nice in theory, but it does not work in any way possible for this mission. It's just too sensitive. Uh, anything the targeter do does for TOI, it'll either hit the moon or fly out into heliocentric space, or it'll get you in a, in a, in a flyby that gets you in completely the wrong orbit. It, it doesn't know what to do to fix that condition, right? This flyby right here is so um, such a critical maneuver, and it's so sensitive that uh, making changes out here to affect that just does not work uh, in any way. So what do you do instead? Um, well, let me start here. So we do something called multiple shooting, which is the um, origin of the name here. Uh, we call it multiple shooting. What I just described previously is called single shooting. You basically, you pick a direction, you shoot your trajectory forward. Uh, if that doesn't work, you pick a different direction, you do it, shoot it forward, you know, do it like that. Um, multiple shooting is you divide your trajectory into multiple segments and you make guesses at each, for each, the beginning of each segment, 
and you shoot them all forward or backwards in various directions such that they all match up in the end. Okay, So divide the problem into multiple segments, and then you patch them together for a final solution. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, I have a backup in case this doesn't work very well, but I'm going to try to draw it live here um, to sort of explain the concept. So we have uh, the Earth. Okay, and we have, let me put the moon here. So what we're going to do is start by uh, at our TOI position. And we're going to say that this segment goes forward in time. All right, so here's TOI. So here's segment one. Next, we have some guess for what the flyby conditions need to be, generally speaking, to get into the orbit we want. So we're going to put a segment that starts right there at this flyby. We're going to go backwards. And we're going to go forwards. Okay, So that's two different segments starting from the same point. One goes backwards, one goes forwards. And picking a new color, uh, but that one. We know what our perigee condition needs to be. So that's the perigee for the mission orbit we want. We're going to start at that point. We're going to go backwards. backwards there, and we're going to go forwards there, such that we're in our uh, final mission orbit. Okay, So that's the concept of multiple shooting. Um, what we ended up here was three segments. So we have one segment, two, three, four, and five. That burn is MOI. So five segments. Uh, in terms of GMAT, that means five spacecraft. So we're going to create five spacecraft. We're going to put them in different spots. We need three initial guesses. Um, so let's see. Five spacecraft. Three Three initial guesses. And uh, so there's a multitude of constraints here. So let's see, the initial guesses. Um, so the initial guess for TOI, we're going to have uh, position, velocity, time. For MOI, position, velocity, time, for the flyby, we have position, velocity, time. And then, because we're actually performing a maneuver here, we need MOI delta V. So all told, this is, uh, let's see, that's seven, that's seven, that's eight initial guesses. So uh, 22 variables being vari varied at any given uh, iteration. And then we have some constraints. So the constraints on uh, TOI are, they're actually printed in this tutorial, we need to be at perigee, 
All right, so TOI needs to happen at perigee. That's one condition, one, yeah, one uh, constraint. We need uh, altitude of 285 kilometers. And we need an inclination of 28.5 degrees. Okay, because we're launching from the Kennedy. You know, that's our, that's our, uh, our given. Uh, for flyby, no constraints. Turns out that any constraint we have that uh, the flyby not be inside the lunar radius is already satisfied implicitly. We don't need to satisfy uh, anything there. And for MOI, we have, uh, let's see, um, perigee is 15 RE, apogee is Sixty RE and inclination is ten degrees. Okay, and then uh, we have these two points. So this point right here and this point right here, we need what are called co-location uh, constraints. So your spacecraft in the final design is going to cruise on uh, segment one. It's going to cruise through segment two on, on towards this flyby. It has no artifact that that discontinuity between one and two even exists. So there should be no maneuver there. It should be completely continuous from one to the other. Um, same thing with three. It's going to start. It's going to continue through the flyby, out to apogee here, through apogee, and on to MOI with no artifact of this uh, discontinuity ever being there. Yep. You also have to impose a constraint that the uh, velocity be continuous as well. Yes, exactly. Yep. So these two spots right here. Yeah, and they have to be at the same time too. <laughs> You'll have problems. So. Here we impose uh, position, velocity, time, position, velocity, time. So that's seven. That's seven. That is three. That is three. So what do we end up with? We have. Uh, 22 variables and what's the math? 14 plus 6, 20 different constraints uh, in the problem. Uh, so that's a little bit more than our normal targeting, you know, change one maneuver, achieve one condition sort of thing. Uh, this takes some uh, heavy hitting in terms of optimization, and that's why we use the uh, VF13 optimizer that we're um, using here. Uh, any questions about the setup? So what we're going to do in GMAT is you have a script in your tutorials folder called uh, multiple shooting tutorial step one. And what we're going to do at the beginning is go through how this script is configured um, so you have some understanding of how this maps to the general setup we just discussed. You said this would take an analyst. How long to put together with the same question? Oh, I mean, we've been, I don't know, I think the script was created in uh, I mean, 
months of development time to get it right. Uh, a lot of the effort is in coming up with initial guesses for those five segments that actually work. Um, so just writing up the structure, uh, you know, it's a standard sort of algorithm. Right. Um, yeah, the devil's in the initial guess part of it. So, the general approach here, actually, hmm, it's kind of small. All right, so what do we need? So we need a moon-centered coordinate system. Uh, remember, we're placing two spacecraft at the flyby. So we need a coordinate system that's centered at the moon, so we can just place it um, there relative to the moon. We need uh, five spacecraft, one spacecraft per segment. We need two propagators, an Earth-centered and a moon-centered. Uh, because we're flying through the sphere of influence of the moon, you generally want to switch propagators in that, um, in that scenario. Uh, we have a maneuver. We're going to use that maneuver twice. Um, many user variables to store all the parameters, and we need a VF13 optimizer. Okay, so we're going to start here with uh, what's not mentioned is we're going to create our resources. And then this block right here is sort of pseudocode for how we're going to do the mission sequence. So we're going to begin by defining optimization initial guesses. So I mentioned this is the hard part. We've done it for you in this case. It's beyond the scope to figure out how these initial guesses are generated. Initialize a bunch of variables, and then we have this optimization sequence here. It's like a targeting sequence. It's a loop. It iterates, um, except the only difference is that instead of achieving a parameter, you have constraints and a minimization function. Uh, so we'll perform some initializations. Uh, we'll vary the times on each of the five segments, so we'll change them all in time. Vary the control point state values and assign them to their spacecraft. So we're changing the, the time, the epoch, then we're changing the state. We apply our constraints before propagation, our initial constraints. We propagate the spacecraft. This is sort of a dividing line in the algorithm. Actually propagate the spacecraft. And then we apply our constraints on the final states. So we apply our initial constraints, propagate them all in their various directions, then apply the final constraints. And then we apply some constraints that apply to the entire mission orbit. Then the cost function, minimize delta v, usually. And then we're done. So that's the general outline. And we'll do it in five steps. Actually, four steps, because I'm going to skip one of them. Um, we're going to sort of go through the sequence, make sure we understand it. Then we'll run it and analyze the initial guess. Then we'll uh, enforce continuity, run it again. So now we have a uh, continuous solution that doesn't meet mission constraints, but it's continuous. It's a starting point patch point constraints. Then we'll turn on the mission constraints, see if we can find a solution. And then we'll, uh, we'll skip this one. This one is uh, it, it's showing how you can use a continuous solution as your initial guess to reduce runtime. And then we'll actually, this will be a bit of uh, work yourself, we'll, we'll just have an exercise where we try to add a constraint and see if we can um, improve things. So I'm switching to the script now. All right, so we 
we start by configuring our resources. All right, so here's our coordinate system, Moon MJ2000 EQ. That's just, you know, convention for naming. The origin is the moon. The axes are J2000. Next, we need our spacecraft. So here we're creating uh, one, two, three, four, five spacecraft. And they're named by the name of their segment. So this one begins at TOI. This one is begins at the flyby going forward. This one begins at the flyby going backward. This one begins at MOI going backward. This one begins at MOI going forward. All right. So. In our diagram, we had five segments. Here, we're implementing that with five spacecraft. And notice the ones that start at the flyby have moon-centered coordinate systems. OK. Uh, force models and propagators. Here's a near-Earth force model and a near-moon force model. The only difference is near Earth has some non spherical gravity terms that the near moon one doesn't. And we just have a couple propagators that are identical, except, you know, a propagator uses a force model. If you have two force models, you need two propagators. All right. Here we have our one maneuver, MOI. And we've created a bunch of uh, variables. So these are all variables. You have to create them up front to store values in. So the convention here is if it starts with CON, it's storing a constraint value. If it starts with error, it's storing an error value. And uh, here's some other uh, variables just for convenience. OK, here's our optimizer. This is the part that uh, folks in class have access to. So this VF13AD is a plugin um, that enables this optimizer. You just create it. You set some values. The only difference here from normal is we've set a 200 um, iteration maximum on it. So if you give it a really bad guess, it can take up to 200 iterations to fix it. Normally, that number is like 20 or 15 or something. And we've got some orbit view plots, some XY plots, some report files. We'll cover that stuff when we get to it. All right, so looking at the mission sequence, we can go back to our um, pseudocode here. So look, here we're defining initial guesses, initializing variables, performing an optimization sequence. Here we're doing the same thing. So here's our initial, ga initial guess. Um, again, generating this was outside the scope of this particular um, tutorial, so we gave one to you. These are initial guesses for the uh, maneuvers. So here's TOI, flyby, MOI. These are times in a modified Julian format. So about five days between TOI and flyby, about 20 days between flyby and, and MOI. And then we have states. So that's a TOI state. Uh, here's a flyby state relative to the moon. Uh, and here's an MOI state. So these aren't perfect. They're not. Uh, they don't meet our constraints, but they're close enough that they'll get us where we want to go. And then, of course, here's a guess for the MOI delta V magnitude, um, about 70 meters per second. OK. 
Okay. Next, we're setting some constants and initializations, uh, things like earth radius. Um, here's our constraints. Remember, we uh, went through what the constraints should be. 285 kilometer perigee, 28 and a half degree inclination, um, 60 earth radius for mission orbit uh, apogee, 15 earth radius for perigee, 10 degree inclination. And I didn't mention our patch states. This is saying that the patch point between segments one and two is one day from launch. Patch state uh, between uh, three and four is 13 days from launch. Uh, any reason for those particular values is sort of arbitrary. We're saying that this time here, that time is one day, and this time is 13 days. Does it matter if it's two days and 15 days? No, we just needed some metric to know where it would meet in the middle. Okay. So here's our optimized loop. We start by just initializing some things. And now we're varying the uh, times. All right. So here's the epic of TOI, the epic of flyby, the epic of MOI. And here we're assigning them back to uh, their spacecraft. OK. So we perform a varies on them, assign them back to the spacecraft. And that configures it. It guesses at the um, at the times that those segments start at. Next, we vary the states. Okay, so remember, each spacecraft is, is still at the beginning of its segments. So here we vary the states. Here's x, y, z for t, o, i, uh, x, y, z in velocity position and velocity for the flyby segment, position and velocity for the MOI segment. And here's the magnitude of that burn. So again, all we're doing is using our vary commands um, to uh, tell the optimizer this is what you can control. After things get moved around, hey, yep. Um, some folks, you know, they're running the script and they're getting the error that we are considering not to be able to do that on the screen. They don't need to be able to do that on the screen. Oh, yeah. So, like I was saying before, the um, the script won't be able to run for you guys since uh, we're we're happy we're demonstrating basically an internal plugin right now. Um, there are. Uh, solutions to that, you could compile the um, plugin yourself after the class, or you could use MATLAB's optimizer. Um, but think of this as a demonstration of what GMAT can do optimization-wise. Um, we just aren't allowed to distribute the, the code that we um, built in-house. Um, again, it's freely available. You can download it and build it. We just can't give it out. Um, right. So this line is just copying spacecraft back and forth. What is it doing? Well, it's enforcing this and this. So these two spacecraft right here, segments two and segments three, there's no constraining continuity there. We just uh, we adjust the flyby. Adjust the flyby. And then we set segment three equal to segment four. All right, so we just set them equal to each other. Mm -hmm. Same thing here. We adjust and adjust and set segment four and five equal to each other. We set them equal with columns? Nope, we just assign them directly so they're identical. The only difference between segment four and segment five, they have the same initial state, they're just being 
propagated in different directions. Oh. Yep. All right, uh, so we have some constraints. I'll cover that later. More constraints. And here we are. So this is the big dividing line here where we propagate the segments. Okay, so everything above this happened on the initial states, the initial points of those segments. Now everything here is actually involved with propagating the segments either forward and backwards to their final uh, conditions. Okay, so here we're uh, propagating uh, TOI. All right, so there's TOI to patch point one. Here's flyby backwards. Remember, we're doing it in a backwards direction, backwards in time. Here's flyby forwards. And here's MOI backwards in backward direction, back prop. And finally, down here is MOI forwards. Okay, so this one starts at MOI, goes into the mission orbit. All right, so that's propagation. Now, once things, once all the segments are at their final conditions, we can apply these collocation constraints. These are the ones that are saying that uh, segments one and two need to be continuous in the middle. Segments three and four need to be continuous in the middle. So all we're doing is we're setting TOI equal to flyby backwards in uh, XYZ position and velocity. Uh, MOI forwards, or yeah, MOI backwards to flyby forwards, all right, in position of velocity. And these are all constraints. The tolerances on those are just default tolerances. They're like um, centimeters or something from each other. Um, And then uh, down here at the bottom, we can apply a cost function and do a minimize. That's commented out for now. And we have a stop command. So when I run this, it's going to propagate through the initial segments, and it's going to give a nice picture of what we're doing. The point of that is we've done all that configuration. We need to make sure that what we've created actually makes sense. Okay, so it doesn't take very long to propagate that out. Um, folks on the phone, if you, you're actually able to do this, you'll have to comment out. Um, well, I was thinking you'll have to comment out some of the optimization lines, but I think it might be more complicated than that. So I'll just describe. So here's our initial guesses. So it looks a lot like that picture. Here's the Earth. Here's the Moon. Segment 1, TOI. Segment 2, Segment 3, Segment 4, and Segment 5. I don't know why the colors are coming out. There's like variations on gray. I'm not sure. You might want to. I don't know if that's something in the script or what. Okay. So, since this is initial guess, you'll notice here and here we have clear discontinuities between those segments, right? 
because we haven't enforced any uh, collocation constraints. So remember, segment one and segment two are just going towards each other. They end up at the same time, but the orbits are different. So there, there's a discontinuity right there. Same thing here. Segment three is being propagated forward to the same epoch as segment four is propagating backwards, but there's a discontinuity there that we need to fix. And of course, at this point, segment five is an orbit, but it doesn't meet all of our constraints at this point. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to activate that and that and try to line things up to make a feasible trajectory. So I'm just going to open up the step two script, which has this already done. And I'll sort of point out what's changed. One thing that's changed is we've turned off the graphics. So we're setting uh, the orbit view show plot uh, field to false. Uh, one thing you'll find is if you're doing some heavy hitting optimization with lots of iterations, if you have 3D graphics going on at the same time, it really slows down. So um, instead, we're using some uh, some XY plots to get a, an idea of what's going on. And second, uh, so these were enabled already, but I'll point them out again. Here's our co-location constraints. TOI equal to flyby backwards, MOI backwards equal to flyby forwards, both in position and velocity. And we've removed the stop command. So now the propagation, instead of stopping at the initial guess, it'll iterate and actually solve the problem. Notice we're still not minimizing. OK, that's commented out. We're just finding a feasible solution. So what you're looking for if you run this is uh, these two plots are showing errors in position and velocity for the co-location constraints. Okay? So you, do expect, you would expect that these will be driven to zero if our optimization is proceeding correctly, and position as well. These two windows are showing uh, existing error in the inclination and in the orbit rate, uh, apogee and perigee uh, from the constraints that we've set before. So I'll run it out some more. And you'll notice in the top plot, the velocity errors start out high and they drop. The position errors start out high and they drop. But the error in our constraints continues uh, to be high. OK. So here's velocity error, red at 0. Position error, right at 0. Inclination error, remember we're not optimizing, we're not applying mission constraints, so we still have, we're still about, you know, four degrees off of our inclination. And we're still 25,000 kilometers off of our apogee, about 8,500 kilometers off of our perigee at this point. But we have something that's continuous. If you look at the message window here, here's the results. Five iterations, and here's the variances. So 
This looks like about a millimeter. No. Uh, yeah, about a millimeter off in X and Y. Um, 10 to negative 10 and 11 on velocity. So I have two millimeters on X here. Uh, e to the negative 9 and 10 on, on velocity. So those are meet the tolerances that we've uh, set by default here. So that's our continuity. Next step is to apply actual mission constraints and solve for a solution that's not just feasible, but uh, is the orbit that we want. So I'm on step three of the tutorial now. We'll just open up step three script and I'll point out the differences here. All right. Now what do we need to do to actually uh, enforce our constraints? Well, in previous scripts, these lines were commented out. And now they're active. So here's three constraints. Now, notice that this is above the propagate line. Okay, So these are being applied at the initial conditions of each segment. We have TOI inclination. Remember that was uh, 28.5 degrees. We have radius of perigee, which was 285 kilometers. And we have MOI radius of perigee, which was, uh, was it 15 RE? Okay. And then we have this constraint that TOI needs to occur at perigee. So if you were going to write a constraint that said something has to be at perigee, um, one thing you could do is say, well, at perigee my true anomaly is zero, right? So you could write a constraint saying true anomaly has to be equal to zero. Um, it's possible to write that, although you find that it doesn't really behave uh, like you want. Uh, you can be a little bit off of true anomaly equals zero, and you could have a value of 0 0.01, 0 0.001. If you're off a little bit on the other side, you have values of 359 point something or other. Doesn't, the optimizer doesn't understand that angles wrap around, and so you get this big jump in value. So instead what we'll do is, um, it turns out that the dot product of R and V is zero when you're at perigee. Uh, what the velocity vector is aligned with the radius um, or tan, uh, perpendicular, right, perpendicular to the radius vector at that point. Yep. So all we're doing here is we're calculating r dot v. We're saying that r dot v has to be equal to zero at that condition. And that puts you right at perigee. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what in MATLAB you would do, uh, uh, where am I? So in MATLAB you would do like dot function with a couple of, you would do the dot product like that. Um, here we're just doing the multiplication. You could call the MATLAB if you want. A lot of times when I do a cross product, I'll call into MATLAB's function. All right, now we're looking at, uh, we have a few more constraints that are applied to the final states. Here the inclination is equal to 10 degrees. We're doing that after the maneuver is applied, so that's after propagation. And we have this constraint here 
that says that radius of apogee has to be equal to 60 re. All right. So why the difference? Why are some up top, some down below? The ones up top are things that apply, again, to the initial uh, points of the segments. The one down here applies to the final points of the segments. So for example, you have to propagate your segment starting at MOI forward to Apogee before you can apply a test that applies at Apogee. All right. That's the only way. And this could say uh, RMAG if you wanted it to. instead of rad epo. And here, notice we've actually applied our minimization at this point. So we've defined a cost function. It's just an algebraic function. You can decide whatever one you want. Here it's a um, uh, the magnitude of your MOI burn. And we're going to minimize that. So here the optimization has a lot to do. Um, what you'll see when this runs is uh, this uh, velocity, the co-location constraints will drop to zero. The position constraints will drop to zero. The inclination error will improve to zero. And the rad radius of apogee and perigee will come up to zero. And that's how we know we have something successful. But there's interesting behavior to note. Um, you'll see first that the co-location constraints, position velocity, will start decreasing. See how they're going towards zero here? And the mission constraints will also start going towards zero. But this one had to get worse before it got better. See, the velocity was going down, velocity error was going down, down, down. Then it had to jump up and get worse periodically uh, for, for a bit of time before it could get down to zero again. So if we look at our message window, ten iterations instead of five, so it took a little bit longer, a little more work to get uh, to finish. But look, we've met our inclination within e to the negative ten, our radius of perigee within uh, e to the negative seven. Uh, we're at perigee with an error of e to the negative 13 in r dot v. Our co-location constraints are still within, uh, this is about 6, 7 millimeters from being continuous. Um, same thing here, this is actually uh, 30 centimeters from being continuous, enough that the spacecraft won't notice it. And we've achieved the final value of 92 meters per second um, on our maneuver. So at this point, uh, the tutorial has a bit of an exercise here. Um, Obviously, the folks in the room will be able to uh, do this on their computers. The exercise is this. And we'll give you 15 minutes to sort of play around with the script, see if you can, um, uh, if you can figure out this exercise. Basically, what we're doing is we said before the flyby has no constraints. 
well, we're going to get rid of that. We're going to give it a constraint of um, flyby perigee has to be greater than or equal to 5,000 kilometers. So I think at this point we'll take maybe 10, 15 minutes and uh, look through the script based on what we've described here. Um, the point of this is we want to apply a constraint that puts a, uh, a minimum perigee of 5,000 kilometers on this flyby. Okay, So it'll be one line that says a nonlinear constraint with this value. The key is putting it in the right spot that makes sense with the structure. All right, so uh, see if it makes sense to you, and I'll come back in about 10 minutes, and uh, if it doesn't, we'll give some hints. Yep. When you're done, um, why did it converge like there's up there in the script three? Script three? Suggests that the scripts are not the same as the ones in Oh, interesting. All right. Uh, Could we copy and paste the final chromatic solution into the new uh, set No. I haven't changed anything. Uh, yeah, go ahead and. Is anybody's working? No, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. All right, go ahead. I'll let me. Yeah, I killed the team after and entered that. In fact, some of the others too, and we didn't convert. to look at those machines when you're done. I just shut down the unit and just started using this here. Same thing. This is the file also.
All right. Is it okay to assume that everybody who's gotten it, or who will get it, has gotten it? Did anybody make it work without looking at step five? No? Nobody? <laughs> okay. Well, all right. So I mentioned it was one line. Here's the line. The key insight there is that we're applying a constraint on the initial state of the segments that start at the flyby. So here's our propagate block. Everything above here is initial states. And here's our new constraint right here. Nonlinear constraint, same as the others. The spacecraft, the segment is called fly by going backwards direction. That's the one we're controlling. Dot Luna, that's the moon. Dot radius of perigee is greater than or equal to, and this example has a variable, but you would just put in uh, 10,000. Nope, 5,000. Okay. Yeah, because it'll assume Earth if you don't have the dot Luna in there. Yep. So if you tried it and it didn't work, that's probably why, because it was refer it was thinking I want my Earth perigee. So if I run this out, um, you'll see sort of the same behavior. See there in the um, velocity uh, plot, the error went down to zero, then it jumps back up again. Uh, this speaks to a, a, a question that one of the commentators had. Um, why does the, the velocity, and here are the position, why does it jump up, get worse, in order to get better? The answer it just has to do with the vagaries of how optimizers work numerically. I mean, it, it picks a uh, a direction that it thinks is leading to a minimum and it'll go as far as it can before it realizes it's stuck and it'll try a different direction. So here it's um, it's minima or it's uh, getting its constraints, its errors down in velocity and position but notice that its uh, errors in inclination and radius of perigee aren't doing anything. They're not getting any better over that time. So here it's realizing, well, okay, I need to, I need to focus on these. So I'll make these ones worse temporarily. Try a different direction. That's why the collocation constraints get worse, in order to make uh, the other constraints better. Um, that's the best solution, the best answer I have right now. Uh, and you see, with the new constraint, we did achieve. Uh, what we wanted. We have a flyby lunar radius of perigee. It says negative 88. That's 88 kilometers from its, it, we said uh, greater than or equal to 5,000. So it's, it's ending up, uh, what, 89 kilometers away from that boundary. And we did it in 29 iterations. So it jumped from 10 to 29 with the addition of that one constraint because it has to find a new flyby geometry, um, which takes some work. So before we wrap up, we had a couple questions online about um, what if I wanted to do this with the VF or sorry with the MATLAB optimizer. Um, so let me address that real quick. Um, of course, to get the Fmin Con optimizer working, there's a few prerequisites you need. Um, one, you need uh, the MATLAB interface to be configured. Um, you need uh, a valid MATLAB license, a valid optimization toolbox license for any of this to be uh, workable. But assuming you have all that set up, you can actually tell GMAT to use the FMinCon MATLAB's optimizer instead of this one that we're using now. So the easiest way to show is um, 
Uh, in this script, what would you change? Uh, let's see, I'm looking for the optimizer definition. So this line here would change to fmincon optimizer. And of course, you'd have different properties associated with that. And down here, different uh, different nonlinear constraint options are valid. So it looks like that would be okay. We don't have any options here. Um, you can put on your nonlinear constraints options like maximum step size, um, uh, upper and lower bounds, that sort of thing. Some of those are valid with certain optimizers and not other optimizers. I think Fmin Khan, you can't put a maximum step size on it. Or sorry, that's I'm talking uh, constraints. It has to do with vary. So here, this maximum step size, that's allowed with VF13. It's not allowed with Fmin Khan, which is not a deal breaker, but they work better for different problems. Um, just by way of illustration, I'm going to open up my local copy of GMAT. which has the MATLAB interface configured. And I'm going to see if there's a sample mission that I can pull up. No, it looks like we don't have any. Um, so what you would basically do is here in solvers, notice I have MATLAB interface uh, as an option here. Under solvers, I would create an optimizer. And now I have two options. So here's my VF13. Here's my fmincon optimizer. And I can just create one of those and configure its options just like uh, the other one. Here's the scripting associated with that. Now, if you want to do this uh, at home, um, the first thing to do is enable the MATLAB uh, and fmincon plugins in the uh, GMAT startup file. Then go to the MATLAB interface part of the documentation. Follow these instructions. This describes on Windows, how to configure that interface. Basically, you need to set uh, a system path variable, and you need to run a MATLAB command. Once that's done, you'll be able to run uh, MATLAB, and you can uh, you can configure an fmincon optimizer. Um, and this uh, this reference page here in the documentation describes how that works. It gives some examples and it gives some um, documentation on, on the available options. Um, depends. If, if you're using the last MATLAB that was installed in your system, it runs it automatically. If you're trying to use a version, if you're trying to use version A and you've more recently installed version B, you'll have to rerun it for version A, and that requires admin rights. Yeah. If you just have one copy, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, I will say that the, the version of MATLAB has to match the um, version of GMAT in terms of 32 or 64 bit. So if your GMAT is 32 bit, which is what we distribute, your MATLAB has to be 32 bit because it's, it's operating on a, uh, a library level. All right. Um, any further questions on that uh, MATLAB interface stuff, optimization stuff? I just have 10 minutes of little wrap-up stuff.